don't know if anyone is selling hybrids in North Africa. OK, thank you, Steve, for answering the question. Uh, now um, we will have Dr. Uh, Vikas uh, Plumker, the, the first, uh, the last uh, lecture in this session. Um, the Dr. Vikas uh, Plunker is a research, a research assistant professor, Department of Agronomy and Horticulture, University of Nebraska Lincoln. Um, he got his uh, PSCC uh, in biotechnology from the Institute of Technology in, in from India, and then uh, he moved to USA to study his master's degree in biotechnology, Texas and M, uh, Texas Tech University, uh, and he, he got his PhD in genetics uh, from Iowa State University. Uh, after that, he did his postdoctoral uh, research uh, associate in genomics and bioinformatic University of Nebraska Lincoln, uh, USA. So, Dr. Vikas has a lot of research interests, uh, including exploring um, innovative uh, ways of connecting a genome of uh, two phen <coughs> excuse me, two phenotype at different uh, biological levels, understanding genetic mechanisms and architecture of traits important for bio line and hybrid cultivars, uh, abiotic stress tolerance as well, uh, predictive analysis and data driven research for building healthy agriculture uh, systems. So, uh, Dr. Vikas, uh, please start your presentation. Thank you, Ayman. Uh, can you can you hear me all right? And are the slides visible? Yes. Uh, now this is uh, your slide. Which did you? I've shared the slide. Can you see it? Yes. I think your your, your lecture and your photo is is available now. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Ayman. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, Hope you've had a wonderful first day. This is the last talk. Um, before I begin, I would like to thank Emma and the, the other organizers for inviting us to share some of our research efforts. So the title of my talk is Genomic Selection and Genomics Assisted Breeding Delivers Superior Wheat Cultivars. So here, here is the outline of my talk. I would begin by giving you an overview um, of a larger problem that we are trying to address, then describe the wheat cultivar development breeding pipeline here at Nebraska, some challenges and opportunities that exist for us. I will then describe the genomics assisted breeding pipeline, talk a little bit about how we generate our SNP calls, how we analyze our phenotype data, some insights into marker assisted selection, and I will then spend significant amount of time talking about genomic prediction and then showing you how genomic selection has made an impact in the wheat cultivar uh, development process. So to explain the larger problem, I would like to give you an analogy. So I was visiting this uh, Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago a couple of years ago, and I was pretty amazed to see the, the evolution of the bicycles, right? So we've, we've gone from pretty rudimentary ones to, to advanced bikes, but the key purpose of the bikes has more or less been the same, right? So it is the vehicle of transport and it is helping us move from point A to point B. Very similar thing is happening with uh, plant breeding and genetics as well, because the key questions are more or less still the same. We want to increase yield. We want to develop biotic and abiotic resistant cultivars. We need good agronomics and then use quality in the cultivars. The breeding pipeline looks still very similar where we have a large number of lines being screened in the beginning of the program and a few lines towards the end. Right? But what is new and exciting right now is we have these amazing tools. We have better experimental design. We have advanced statistics if genomics, phenomics, and we heard in some of the earlier talks the power of each of them. We have genome engineering and there are many more tools that are being developed as we speak. But the question, the key question though is, how do we then integrate this information and improve the selection decisions, the accuracy and other things in the breeding program so that we can develop superior cultivars? Right. So I will highlight some of these tools and show you how we have integrated those in the breeding program at um, UNL. So the wheat cultivar development program at UNL is very similar to any other bulk breeding method. We begin by making over a thousand crosses, which produces the F1 seeds. This is followed by the seed increases in F2 and F3. 
in a, at a three stage we pick heads and these are then planted as head rows there are about 45000 head rows of these 45000 head rows about 2000 get advanced to the observation yield trial <clears throat> the observation yield trial is the first nursery when the yield potential of the lines are being evaluated so these first set of nurseries are what are referred to as the early generation nurseries. <clears throat> they're grown at single location, single replicate, and they can, as you can imagine, they can be prone to extreme weather changes. So of the 2000 plots in the observation yield trial, about 270 get advanced to the preliminary yield trials. So this is the first multi-location yield trial grown at eight to 10 locations across, this, across the state. It is still one rep, sometimes two reps, and uh, the design that's used is augmented trials. So the last set of trials, the lines that get advanced from the PYT or the preliminary yield trials, enter what we refer to as the advanced and elite yield trials. These are robust phenotypic trials. They're grown at multiple locations and starting from F38, if a line is doing well, then it is retained in, a, in the nursery for more than a year. We have a much better design, alpha lattice, and we at least have three replicates. So these last set of trials are what I would refer to as the gold mine of your good quality phenotype data. They're extremely good uh, in terms of the phenotypic quality. So this is a pretty robust breeding pipeline has been going uh, on for, for several years. We heard from Steven a little bit about this, about the program here. Um, you know, the program has released nearly 35 to 40 cultivars over the years. So it is pretty robust, but there are also some challenges and we think these are also opportunities for some of the emerging tools. And in this talk and in this slide, I'll focus more on the F35 and F36 nursery. So as I mentioned earlier, the F35 nursery is the observation yield trial. So this is the first time the yield of lines is, is evaluated, but it is only grown in one location in the eastern part of the state here in Lincoln. But the hope is that the lines that do well and get advanced to the subsequent nurseries then perform well across the state, which may or may not be true because we are basing our evaluations just based on one year. And also there are no replicates for this trial because of the limited amount of seed. So the, you can imagine the phenotype quality is not great. So lower broad sense heritability. And because it is grown in one location in one year, it can be prone to extreme weather changes. So we could have hailstorms, we could have a drought stress here, and this will impact the phenotypic data for those trials and the decisions that are being made. Similarly, for the preliminary yield trial, this, this trial has grown across the state. It is slightly better than the observation yield trial, but it is still mostly one rep, an augmented trial. And I'll talk about this augmented trial a little bit later in the talk. So they, they are better uh, than the early generation trials, but the broad sense heritability is still okay. Um, the, the, the other point though is this is only tested for, for one year. Okay, So the decisions are being made just based on one year and we could have an odd year with differences in weather conditions which could influence it. Another thing that we, we should not forget is increasing grain yield. Right? So it's important that we increase grain yield and we can do that in many different ways. And if you remember your, your uh, breeding equation, one of the factors is we, if we can in, reduce the generation interval time. That is, we want to recycle the elite lines sooner to the crossing block and use them as new parents. Right? So we could wait till the end of the, the program and see when it all works well. We could recycle it or if we can identify lines sooner in the fifth or sixth generation, we can start recycling sooner. Okay? That will help us increase the genetic gain. So these are some of the challenges and also I think are opportunities and um, you know, another point is if this program goes on, this breeding pipeline works for over 12 years, and if all works well, we may have a, a breeding line that outperforms an existing cultivar and be released as a new cultivar. So these challenges are some of the points that I will talk in today's talk and how we have addressed those. So next I want to share with you our genomics assisted breeding pipeline. This is especially critical for winter wheat because we harvest winter wheat in, in mid-July and it goes back for planting in mid-September. So we have very little time to analyze the data, make inferences, make decisions, and then design the next trials and then go back for planting. So we really need a robust pipeline. So this is a summary of our genomics assisted breeding pipeline. So each year we sequence about 1500 to 2000 lines using genotyping by sequencing. This is done at K-State uh, in Jesse Poland's lab. 
we then receive the the raw data and this is stored at UNL in the long term storage servers. Each year we combine the GPS information for over the years and do SNP calling using the tassel discovery pipeline. And when I ran this pipeline this year, we had over 11,000 unique lines and we had more than 120,000 high quality SNPs. Most of our phenotypic analysis, especially the augmented trials, and I'll talk about them a little bit in the next few slides. We use ASMLR. Uh, it's a pretty powerful package uh, that can analyze phenotype data and adjust for spatial variation. The outcome of this is the adjusted phenotypes are the best linear and biased predictions on the blocks. So once we have the phenotype data, we have the marker data, we conduct the market rate analysis, and we, we've been focusing on genome-wide association studies for traits with large effect loci and genomic selection for, for grain yield and a few other traits. We then combine all of this information in what we refer to as selection files. It has phenotypic data, it has the estimated breeding values, we have the markers from marker assisted selection, quality, and many other traits and notes that we take. The breeder then uses this information to make uh, advancement decisions. And you will see later in this in this talk that you know utilizing some of these um, emerging technologies, we have significantly improved the selection accuracy. So in the next few slides, I want to describe to you a little bit because I know there could be students listening to the talk, uh, a little more details about SNP calls, how we do our phenotypic analysis, just one or two slides for marker assisted selection, and then I will spend a lot of time talking about genomic protection. So for our SNP calls, that's the SNP discovery and genotyping, it is now done in a single step using genotyping by sequencing. In, in simple words, this is uh, sequencing the lines using one at a 1x coverage costs about 20 to 25 dollars per line and this method has worked fairly well uh, this is sort of a busy slide but please follow along and just focus on the two columns that have been highlighted here so we will look at different projects and the number of high quality SNPs that are available for this for biparental studies uh, for, for what we have performed over the years, we've seen anywhere between 2,000 to 4,000 high quality SNPs on linkage maps. And for genome wide association studies, we are looking at anywhere between 26,000 to 35 to 37,000 SNPs. And some of these were done by faculty members in ER department, Amara Morad and Ahmed Salam. They were visiting here, uh, visiting scholars, did excellent work. These are some really interesting articles. And for genomic selection, we were looking at anywhere between 40,000 to 50,000 SNPs, but this year and last year we've used about 55 to 60,000 high quality SNPs for predictions. So the GBS method has worked fairly well in terms of the number of high quality SNPs that we get. But in addition to the, the number of SNPs, they're also well distributed across the genome. What we see here is the distribution of high quality SNPs along each of the chromosomes of bread wheat. And you can see that it is pretty highly high dense, uh, high density. And um, in 2020, when we did the SNP calling, we have our database has more than 120,000 high quality SNPs. All of this work though has been done using uh, the IWGSC RefSeq version one, which is the latest high quality genome assembly. So that has worked fairly well, it is great. But um, we can also start now looking at some of the novel variants which may have we may have missed looking at just using one reference assembly. So we now has a few additional assemblies and there is effort going on for pan genome. So if, if you're unfamiliar with pan genome, what it is is it's the sum total of the genes and genetic variation within a species. So if you so in this um, pictorial representation here, what we see is we have three cultivars and they have the core component, which is common across cultivars, the common genes and the common variants. But we could also have unique variants within within each of these cultivars. And when we when we are using just a single reference, we may be missing those unique and novel variants. So we, we did a small experiment where we wanted to test a few other genome assemblies and see the performance of those assemblies. So we took one of the a preliminary yield trial about 300 lines from that trial and we ran the SNP calling using many different assemblies. So we looked at version one, which is what is used in many of the wheat projects currently going on. 
We also looked at Chinese Spring version 2 assembly, uh, Jagger, which is the winter beet cultivar from US, Nurin 61 from Japan, Stan B from Canada, and SY Mattis from France. And all of the lines in the 300 lines in the in the trial had about 1.35 million GPS tags. And there are some really interesting observations, although this is preliminary insights. We see that the, the percentage of GPS sequences that map to each of these assemblies is pretty good. It's more than 90%. This is pretty amazing because, you know, to put together something like Chinese Spring version one, it has taken a long time, a decade or so, to get a good quality assembly. The fact that now we have additional assemblies and they are doing extremely well and, and doing, in fact, better than Chinese Spring one, version one, tells us that you know it may not be difficult to to put together a reference assembly and based on the project that we are interested in we can look at additional assemblies a, another important point here is we wanted to see if we can map more gps tags than what we are doing with just using version one and we can see when we used version two we mapped an additional 635 when we use Jagger, we map more than 4,800 and so on with, with the other assemblies. But we were expecting to see higher mapping with Jagger because Jagger is a winter wheat cultivar, whereas Chinese Spring is a spring type cultivar and Jagger is from, from the US. So they, it could be more closely related to the Nebraska lines. So we were hoping that we would see higher mapping. So something to keep in mind is higher mapping means these could be mapping to different regions in the genome which were completely lost when we were mapping to Chinese Spring. And these could harbor those novel variants. So that is that is a work that is currently ongoing. We are looking at SNP calls from different assemblies and we want to see how they perform. In fact, can we can we capture some of the market rate associations which were being lost when we use just a single assembly? So this is uh, the, the subsequent part of the work is, is a lot of work in, in progress. So overall, the genotyping by sequencing methodology has, has worked fairly well and given us reasonably good number of SNPs to perform many different kinds of, of projects. So next, I want to talk to you a little bit about how we analyze our phenotype data. So we've got our good SNP calls and now we need good phenotype data and then use the example of one of the nurseries to explain the process in detail. So we are, what we are looking at is a, a field map of the F36 or the preliminary yield trial. And as I mentioned earlier, this is an augmented trial grown at eight to 10 locations. So we have, usually we have 300 plots and those 300 plots are divided into 10 I blocks shown here separated by this red line. So in each I block, we have three checks and the checks are colored cells and they're repeated in, in every I block, but the entries are tested only once. We heard from the previous speaker about this design and how we could use the checks. I'll talk about this a little bit. This is a good design, but we, we should also see very limited spatial variation in the field if you want to be effective, right? So this is um, in DVI values for one of these, for one of the trials which was mapped, and we see that on one side of the field, the values are pretty high, whereas the other side of the field, the values are lower. And we also see this for grain yield as well. So there is correlation among the plots. So based on where it is in the field, it has a different value. It can have a different yield. And this is not good news because if you remember our a linear mixed model equation, which is used for many of the phenotypic analysis, we have a response term, we have a fixed effect term, we have a random term and we have error term. Our random terms and the error terms, we assume a mean of zero and a variance of sigma square and further the variance structure, we assume an equal variance and covariance of zero. And we know that the covariance is not zero if we see correlations, right? So we can also start adjusting for the spatial variation by using, for example, here I've shown autocorrelation regressive models, which allows for different variants for rows and columns. And we can use you know, these variants, different variant structures, which is readily available in ASRMLR, and we can get better phenotypic estimates. And we've done this for many, many years. I've shown here data for you know the, about four years or so. This is a busy slide, so I'll try to highlight what I want to show here. So in the first column, we have many different models, either accounting for just experimental design, spatial variation, or experimental design and spatial variation. And what I've shown here is, for instance, 
Firma Cook location for Green Hills in 2012, Clay Center in 2014, and Sydney in 2015, it was important to adjust for spatial variation along the rows. And similarly, it was important to adjust for spatial variation along the columns for Clay Center in 12, Lincoln 15, Clay Center 15, and McCook 15. And adjusting for row and column was important in these other locations. So what happens here in, in our pipeline is we go through these different models, we try to adjust for spatial variation, try to find a model that provides the best fit and then get those blocks of the adjusted phenotypes. And we see that by doing this, we are we are improving our heritability, which is important for most of the downstream applications. So the key point here is that we go through this systematically, pick the models that provides the best fit, get the block values for each location, and we can use that with our G by E models. We then inspect the heritabilities for each trial. If it's a really low heritability trial, then that is noise, and we do not want to include it in the subsequent analysis. So if we have balanced trials like the preliminary yield trials, we can treat the locations as replicates and combine them and using combine them and use averages one value per line. We are also now starting to use the unstructured and factor analytic models. I do not have time to go into the details, but what this is, is it is giving us more freedom and more relaxed assumptions for the linear mixed models. It's a one stage analysis. We need not have to go through the model selection that I've showed in the previous slide. This is one step. It is faster and especially for unbalanced trials, especially for our hybrid yield trials where we have different set of hybrids, different number of hybrids and grown in different locations. This in fact works hugely well. Okay. I would strongly recommend uh, students in the in the audience to to look at ASRML manual, but also this this recent textbook that's been published and the G by E models of one stage analysis is quite well explained in this textbook. They've also given the R scripts that you can use. So we heard in the previous talk where you know the speaker talked about different models being used and whether we use single markers or we use haplotypes and we did see slight improvement with the haplotypes. But what I can tell you is I've seen huge improvements by you by getting better phenotype estimates. So the improvements are quite big. So we can go anywhere from for genomic prediction accuracy. We can go from 0.2 to 0.35, right? So I haven't seen such a big improvement using other methods, but using good phenotypic data is really, really important. And some of these advanced models has, has been working fairly well. So I talked about the SNP calling and then about how we generate our phenotype data and how we use the phenotypic data analysis. Um, I have a, a single slide to show you about marker assisted selection and for marker assisted selection, we focus mostly on traits with a large effect loci. We genotype about 270 lines annually with known markers and we predict those straight or favorable alleles for over 1500 lines. And I do not have time to go into the details, but feel free to ask questions and I can explain the methods. So what we are seeing here is the predictions made for those known markers in an F35 nursery having 1380 lines. Okay, The heat map here is color coded. So a value of one, which is highlighted in blue, which means that there is the presence of the favorable allele and the color in yellow or the yellow color represents the unfavorable or the lack of favorable allele. So along these X axis, we have the different known markers and along the, the Y axis, we have each of that is a, is a line and we see a reasonably good amount of diversity. Some of these markers are, are better than others. So we have the, the marker that represents resistance for leaf rust, stem rust, and stripe rust. We can see there are lines where we have the favorable allele and there are lines that do not have them. The SR6 is a stem rust marker. This was identified by Amira Mora in her uh, GWA study. It's a pretty quite, it's a robust marker and we saw that, that it is reproducible. So we are now using it in the breeding program to see lines that are fixed for SR6 and lines that do not have SR6. And looking at similar, the other, other traits where we are looking at height and we do not need translocations because translocations can affect the quality scores. So overall, this marker assisted selection has been working fairly well if we have these large effect loci. So it's, it's been working fairly well, um, especially for these some of these traits. OK, so we talked about our SNP calling. We talked about phenotype data. We talked about how we are using marker assisted selection. So for the rest of the talk, I want to spend more time and, and talk about you know, our genomic prediction and, and genomic selection. 
So the previous speaker did a really good job of explaining, you know, genomic prediction in a simple manner. Um, as he explained, it's a two stage process. In the first stage, we have a training population which is phenotype and genotype, and then we estimate the marker effects. And then in the second step, we have an untested population which is related to the training population, which is only phenot, which is only genotype but not phenotype, and we predict the phenotype of the lines. These predicted values are the genomic estimated breeding values. The correlation between the observed and the genomic estimated breeding value is what is referred to as the predictability, and we can divide that by the heritability to get the prediction accuracy. A lot of the work in the literature has been looking at cross validations, optimizing models, optimizing marker data sets, and I would refer to that as, as genomic prediction in my talk. And what genomic selection is, how do we use these genomic estimated breeding values to make decisions in the breeding program, make better selections, make better advancements? And uh, we have spent significant amount of time brainstorming how we could use GS in the breeding program. So at UNL, we have a long history of, of this work. So we began genotyping many of the lines in 2010 using DART markers. In 2012, we switched to GPS technology and genotyping every single line that comes into the preliminary yield trials. And starting in 2015, we are now genotyping about 1,500 to 2,000 lines in the uh, previous nursery, that's the observation yield trial. And we use the same marker data for lines in the subsequent generations. So I joined this program uh, initially in, as a postdoc and then as a research faculty member in the middle of 2015. And the first talk, task was to bring a lot of these workflows in-house where we did our own SNP calls, we did our analysis, and we ran through a lot of cross-validations. And I'll, I'll share some of those results. And these are published in, a, in an article in, in G3. But what was important for us is how do we then start using this information to, to make better selection decisions and use them in the breeding program. And in 2020, it's been four to five years that we started doing this and we can now evaluate and optimize genomic selection. So a lot of the cross validations to get an insight about the predictability for grain yield has been published in a G3 article. And these are some of the tools that we've used in those articles. Um, we largely focus on using GBLOP model and we heard from the previous speaker that, you know, which is also very true in the literature that, you know, exploring different models hasn't really given a lot of benefit. So we focused on using GBLOP and BGLR package. I also want to point out that all of the data and the R code for the analysis that R code that I talked about, testing different models, getting the phenotype, uh, the bluffs, adjusted bluffs, all of that is available in the supplementary information of this manuscript. So the next few slides, I want to give you some insights from the predictability or running cross validations. What I'm showing here is the predictions made on a 2015 preliminary yield trial nursery. On the Y axis, we have the predictability. On the X axis, we have the percentage of missing data from 2015, which goes into the, the prediction set or the test set. So for instance, when I say NA50, so 50% 50 of the lines are marked missing in 2015, and they become the test set. So the rest of the 50% of the lines from 2015 and three additional years, 2012, 13, and 14, are in the training set. And we run the predictions, and this is repeated with a different set of 50% of the lines 10 times. And each dot here is the predictability for each of those runs. And the average of the 10 runs is the number on top. And what we see is when we are predicting a small number of lines in a new year, our predictability is reasonably high and it is similar to a broad sensitivity value. For 50% of the lines, we are doing pretty okay, but when you are predicting an entire new nursery in a new year, our predictabilities are about 0.167. We also looked at this in different years in, in 2012, 13, and 14. And what we what we, we saw very similar results. We for NA50, we are doing reasonably okay. And when you're predicting a new year up heritability or the predictability is about 0.262, which is slightly lower. This is all work done on 270 lines for predictions and using the three years in the training set. So this is a smaller nursery. We also repeated this analysis on the observation year trial. This is a much bigger nursery, 1,500 to 2,000 plots. 
And what we see very similar results where we are trying to predict 50% of the lines in a new nursery in a new year. We have values about 0.4 or so. And given that the underlying phenotype data for the observation yield trial, which is one replicate, low heritability. So we are correlating with not so good phenotype data, but we are still seeing reasonably good predictability for 50% of the trial. And when you're predicting an entire set of 1500 to 2000, we're looking at about 0.15 to 0.2. Okay. And, and you should not forget that we are correlating with the phenotype data, which is which is not perfect. So the, the key points that we saw here when we ran these cross validations is that when you are trying to predict the grain yield for 50% of the nines in a new year, in a new nursery, we're doing fairly well. And when we try to predict a completely new year, all of the lines in the new nursery, we're looking at about 0.15 to 0.25 prediction accuracy. And we think that this prediction accuracy for a new year is heavily influenced by the year to year variation, right? So we may see a normal year. The next year we may have a drought year or a heat stress year, and even just the phenotypic correlations are heavily influenced in such cases. So we think that the year to year variation as well as the underlying phenotype data because of the spatial variation and fewer replicates is influencing these values. But that being said, it is still around you know, 0.25 or it could be 0.3. The question then is this is all great from an exploratory perspective. So we got some insight. We have looked at the prediction accuracies. We can definitely grow half the trial and save the cost like the speaker highlighted in the previous speaker highlighted that we can drop some of the lines and only grow some of the lines, right? So we could save cost by doing that, but we really want to figure out how do we start using GS with these predictive abilities, which could be influenced by this. They are fairly good. How can we start using them in the breeding program? And you know that was really an important question that had to be addressed. Okay, so the next few slides I'm going to show you um, sort of like the Eureka moment that we had when we were looking at these uh, genomic predictions. So the next slide is talking about retrospective prediction. This is a, a very important slide in my talk, so I will um, describe this pretty slowly and uh, please follow along. So these are predictions made on the 2012 preliminary yield trial using 2013, 14 and 15 as the training set. A prediction or predictive ability is about 0.216. On the x-axis, we have the observed value or the blocks. On the y-axis, we have the genomic estimated breeding values or GBVs. The two vertical lines are the mean blobs and the mean of the entries that were selected for the next year. The two horizontal lines are the mean GBV and 75 percentile GBV. What I've also shown here is the number of years the lines were retained in the breeding program. So the lines highlighted with a red dot, they were they were only tested for one year. The green triangles made it to the second year. The green rectangles made it to the third year. The plus mark lines made it to the fourth year. And this rectangle, which is checked, these are there are two lines which made it to the to the fifth year. And if you observe this plot carefully, what we saw is if the lines were having above average blub and above average GBV, so this upper right quadrant, lines in this upper right quadrant are being retained for longer times in the breeding program. In fact, one of these lines was recently released as the latest cultivar from the breeding program. We repeated this analysis in another year in 2013, and in fact, we have now tested this in, in several years since then. So a very similar plot predictions made on 2013 nursery using 12, 14 and 15 as a training set. We have the blobs, we have the GBVs, and what we see is again very similar results where you know lines in this upper right quadrant with above average GBV and blob are being retained for, for longer, longer times. And we did see some some exceptions. There was a tall wheat line which performed well that single year. It had a really low GBV, but its bluff is really high. And there, there are two aspects to this. One is, you know, it could be that it performed well in that year because this is single replicate uh, across locations. It could be that it was just performing well. It was in sweet spot in the field and did well, but it is also possible. In this case, there is tall wheat line, which are, you know, there is a preference to lead, retain tall wheat lines because they do well in the western part of the state, which is more drier than the eastern part of the state. 
right? But a lot of the lines, the rest of the lines that we have in our training set are those semi dwarf lines, right? So our training set doesn't have the representation of tall weight lines. So predicting something that is not represented well in training set could sit in this quadrant with the GBV being low. So we have to watch for those lines. So of these lines that are in this upper right quadrant, we have many lines now in state variety testing, about four of them, and one line is being negotiated for release. So this was really interesting for us. We saw that you know accuracy of predicting a new year can be low. This could be influenced by the genotype by environment, genotype by year interactions, and the year-to-year -year environmental variation. But what we did see though is if the lines that had above average blob and above average GBV, they are being retained for longer times in the breeding program. Another way to think about this is if our GBV is below average for those lines, they, those are the lines that do not retain in the long, long for longer times in the breeding program. So any line that has below average GBV will probably not get advanced subsequently. So we can easily exclude the 50% of the lines, which are probably going to fare badly, but we can subset those top 150 or 50% of the lines and then use them. So these were some really interesting insights from cross validations as well as retrospective predictions. Then we put together all of this information and we, we came up with a strategy of how we could use this going forward in the breeding program to make to make better selection decisions. So this is a very similar plot that I've shown earlier. I'm going to explain the, the methodology here. So we have the blobs on the x-axis, we have GBV on, on the y-axis, we have you know the mean blobs and the 75 percentile blobs, and we have the mean GBV and 75 percentile GBV. So if a breeder selects lines just based on phenotype, those lines would be in this quadrant. Right? And if the lines are selected just based on GBV, those are in the upper quadrant. But what we know is that lines in this upper right quadrant are the ones that are doing well and are being retained for longer times. So A, we could do something like what we heard from the previous speaker where we could sort our GBVs and rank lines based on you know, higher GBV to lower GBV. Okay? We, can, we can do that if our predictive abilities are really high and matching our broad sensitivity with the fact that we have you know, mid-level, mid-range of predictive accuracy. So instead of ranking lines based on GBV, we assign them priority groups. So we said line that is excellent for both GBV and block, we will all rank them as one. The lines that are good, excellent for GBV and okay for blob gets a 2.1 and the lines that are excellent for blob and okay for GBV gets a 2.2 and lines that are okay for GBV and blob gets a 3. And we didn't want to lose those lines which could be hard to predict. We assigned them a priority group rank 4. So instead of ranking lines based on GBV, we, we assign them the priority groups and then use them to rank the lines. And the rest of the lines in these quadrants can be easily dropped if the decisions are made just based on EL. But what happens usually in the breeding program is we shortlist this as a first set of lines based on green EL and then start looking subsequently at other traits. So this strategy was implemented beginning in 2016. And we have some data now to see how this has worked. Right? So this is the predictions made on the 2016 nursery using data from 2012 to 2015 as the training set. So along the x-axis, we have the observed value, y-axis, we have GBV. Our prediction or predictive ability was slightly high that year. We assigned the ranks for the lines based on the blob and the GBV values. And from the preliminary trial to the advanced trial, the first year, the decisions were made based on the rankings as well as phenotype of other traits. And what we see is that all 18 lines from quadrant one were advanced. 18 of the 21 lines from 2.2, nine of the 21 lines. And we also retained two lines just to see that, you know, these are really high GBV, but the phenotype of that one year was bad. We also had some lines that did not have marker data and there was pref there's preference to retain tall weak line and that was advanced as well. So this is going in from FT6 to FT7 where we use both genomic selection and phenotypic data for some of the other traits besides EL. But everything since this year, is going into the advanced and the trials. These are robust trials, good phenotype data, heavily replicated. So we rely mostly on the phenotype. So what I've shown here is 
you know, what lines got advanced from 2017 to 2018. So eight of them from one, seven from 2.2, none from 2.1. The ranking of these two really high values was low and two lines with no marker data, the tall wheat line was still retained. What I've also shown is the ranking of the lines in the year of 2018. And we see that the ranking being in the top in the top half for you know the priority one group as well as the 2.2 group not so much for gbv this could be just that one year or it could also be that we do not have sufficient power to do it well and definitely this isn't looking great so going forward 2019 and you know 2020 we have information until 2020 now so what's left in 2020 is about three lines from quadrant one and one line from quadrant 2.2 and if you look at their rank it is ranked suck one of the line is ranked second 2 12 and 28 are the ranks for the three lines and ranked third for this 2.2 so this is a three-year average score of uh, of score and and ranking so this this nursery is an interstate nursery has about 57 lines has lines that were re released as new cultivars recently has also new uh, experimental lines that are being tested and if if a line comes out with a rank of two across three years it tells us that that line is an exceptionally good line and we have been able to successfully retrieve that good line for green yield using genomic selection uh, strategy that we have developed. Another way to look at this is is correlating information from the year of prediction and the subsequent year. So there's about 270 lines in the year can be predicted and there's about 57 lines that get advanced and we can run the correlation for those, right? So this is this was correlation when we had pretty normal years, 2016 and 17. If we correlate the phenotype, the rank correlation for the year of prediction and the subsequent year of testing, it was fairly high. And this is not usually the case when we have odd or you know years that are difficult. Right, to predict. And then when we use just GBV, if we just rank lines based on just the GBV, we are not doing great. And this could be because of the low prediction accuracy. But if we select our priority group once and then rank lines within the priority group once, we see a fairly high rank correlation value that tells us that the line performance between year one and year two is fairly high, not so much in terms of having for 2.1 and 2.2 has been doing fairly well. But what happens when we have an odd year, right? So 20, this is results for 2017 to 2018. 2018 was a severe heat stress year. With that week of flowering, we had temperatures ranging more than 100 Fahrenheit. And when that happens, we see that if we base our decisions just based on phenotype, the rank correlations between 2017 and 18 is really low. GBVs is low, but the priority group one has done fairly well. So what that tells us is by using these priority group rankings, we've been able to select for lines that are relatively stable and doing well even under difficult conditions. So it has helped us bring do really well in, in advancing lines that would do well. Another example that I want to share with you is about what we have observed in the observation yield trials. In the observation yield trial, we had you know, one of the years when we had a hailstorm and 50% of these 50% of the trial got damaged and you can see the ranking of GPV and BLUP is quite different. So there were about 719 lines, 1719 lines in 2016. They were hail damage. There were 812 lines that were less hail damage and 907 lines that were severely hail damaged. We used, there was no way to have good phenotype data for these lines. All of the lines that were retrieved from the severe hail damage was based on genomic selection. And you can see since then what has happened in 2019, we still had four lines and the ranking of these four lines in 2018 was extremely good. In fact, we still have like one line that is going really strong from these four lines and it ranked seventh in a three year average. So this line, which is doing so well, would have been completely thrown out and excluded from the breeding program if we had not used genomic selection to bring it back. So to summarize some of the impacts that GS has had in the breeding program, we know that we cannot predict the top most best lines, but we can certainly say what are the 50% bad lines. And doing this, we have now reduced the size of the trial, and that will help us not only you know, reducing the cost, but also getting good quality phenotype data, which would be helpful for training set. 
by using GBV and BLOPS, we have significantly improved selection accuracy. And for the early generation trials, this has been more or less like an insurance program where we have retrieved lines during bad years. And I hadn't had a lot of time. I didn't have a lot of time to talk about, you know, some of the, you know, how we recycle lines. But what we have also done is use GBVs to recycle some of these elite lines much sooner to the crossing block. And we heard in in the first talk from Stephen that we are now using this methodologies to to select and make precise crosses in our hybrid program. With that, I would like to thank the funding agencies. I would like to thank uh, the postdoctoral mentor and my postdoctoral advisor and my current mentor, Stephen Benzeder, the small grains leader here at UNL, and my co authors of the study, Mary J. Uh, Gutieri, Ibrahim L. Besioni, Sarah Blaka, Fang Wang, Diego Harquin, and Jesse Polan. And I would also like to thank uh, the technicians in, in the group, Greg Don and Mitch Montegomery. They are the backbone of the program. Uh, several former and current students and many, many of them from the small grains group who pitched in and helped at different times in, in the project. That I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, I'm not sure if I still have time, but I would be happy to answer questions if there are any. Thank you. So uh, thank you uh, because so much for this interesting lecture. So if you have like, published uh, question, you will have uh, one question, so I did this is a comment actually is this so still phenotyping selection gives good results. Yeah, it, it, it depends on, you know, that's a good question. Phenotypic selection works well when things are perfect, right? So I showed you examples where we had an odd year, right? What happens then we had a hail storm, right? And there's absolutely no way to get good phenotype data. Right, so depending on the condition, depending on the nursery, I would say using genomic selection, especially in your early generation nursery, helps really well. But that being said, for the later nurseries, starting from F37, when you have robust trials, you have you know small number of entries, you have heavily replicated trials, your broad sense heritability is at more than 0.7 or so, it is absolutely impossible to beat that using just genomics. But on the other hand, in the early generation, when we don't have such kind of information on our lines, there is no other alternative other than using genomic selection and some of the emerging technologies. OK, so uh, I have a couple of questions myself. So yeah. first, uh, first one that you in the genomic selection, you use uh, tra uh, pop training population, right? And then you predict in other population. So, uh, what are the characters of these populations? Can can I use biparental population uh, to predict in, in, in diverse collection or vice versa or should be both population should be a diverse collection? That's a really good question, Ahmed. Um, so if, if so many of the lines that we are using are these nurseries, right? So there's a big there's a mix of biparental populations. So to, so to answer your question, it depends on, on the research question, right? So you can use biparental populations. Your prediction accuracy when you use biparental population will be really high because your kinship is will be really high between your training and test set. And when you use a diverse population, you can still do that. But as we heard from the previous speaker, it'll depend on the kinship between the training and test set. So it all comes down to the question. So, you know, for QTL mapping, we have to stick to the biparental populations. For GWAS, we can use germplasm, but we can also use a nested association mapping where we have mix of biparental populations. The same thing would be true for genomic selection. You can have a, a different, you know, a collection of biparental populations, or you can also have diverse collections. It depends on the research question that we are trying to address. But the key point though is especially if you are using methods like GBLOB, the relationship, the kinship between the training and test set is really important. Right? So if we try to predict a completely unknown nursery and if the genetic background of that nursery is completely different and it is not related to your training set, then it's pretty much like our, our predictions won't work. OK, so and what is what uh, what is the size of training population that uh, I can start with? Yeah, that, that's a really good question, um, Ahmed. So um, 
if you look into the literature and we heard this in, in the previous talk is, you know, the general notion is larger the training set, which means we are capturing a lot more allelic variation. We would do better, right? Oh. So that is the general notion, but then that doesn't really help us answer the question of your question of how, how many do we need? So I can give oh. you an example of what I have seen. So in, in the nursery where we use our preliminary yield trials, there are about 270 lines in, in that nursery. OK, so having two nurseries, that is 270 in year one, a, a different set of 270 in year two starts to give us prediction accuracy, which is very similar even if we have 10 years data. OK, so it is so it is possible that you may not need a really big training set, but there are other factors, you know, like kinship, uh, the LD, the marker set, all of that, but it will to, the best way to answer that question is to start genotyping a small set and see what trait you are interested in and run the cross validations and see whether you know there is enough power to predict it and we can start increasing it. But at least in our study, what I've seen is having two years of data, a two years of in the real trial, that's 270 and, and 270, right? So uh, that, that would be close to 540 lines. Having 540 lines in our training set and predicting the the new set of 270 has, has been possible for us. OK, so uh, second mm -hmm. question uh, uh, would be, uh, I know that you test uh, your lines in more than one location. Yes. OK, and nine location as I, as I know. OK, I think nine locations uh, that you use. Um, how can uh, genomic prediction or selection overcome the uh, problem of significant G by E? So if I mean, uh, uh, does genomic selection uh, specific for environment, specific environment or locations or group of location or something like that? Can I predict in, in environment in another environment some such? Yes. Those, those are really good questions, Emma. Those are really good questions. So I have, you know, a couple of points to share there. So I think my, my suggestion is, is to think about the end goal. So in the Nebraska program, we are looking at lines that would be doing fairly well across the state. And also there are challenges here in the Nebraska environment because a one year in the east would look like west in the next year. Right. So there's there's quite quite a bit of variation in the environmental conditions. So I think it is, you know, for, for such a condi for such environmental conditions, it may be better that if we have lines that are performing well across the state. In that case, we can use those factor analytic models which would allow to adjust for G by E, you know, go with the G by E and still get single block value. Your second part of the question is can we predict a specific environment? Um, so am I still sharing the slides? Can you see the slide, Emma? Yes, I just I, I, I will uh, present it. <laughs> okay. So, okay, let, let me know when you are yes. able to see okay. the slide. It says predictions yes. for location. Yeah. So this is I did not have time to talk about this. A lot of the work that I that I shared was using single block value for across locations, but this wow. is now saying predicting for each location specifically and then correlating phenotype in that year. And these are the same cross validations NA10 to NA100. NA100 means we are predicting a new nursery, but now we are specifically predicting for Makkup or specifically predicting for Sydney. Yes, it is possible to use G by E models to start looking at performance in specific location in specific environments if that is the goal of of the of the research yes it is possible and we have done that where we are starting to look at g by e but the question then comes up is you know is this is this really excellent um because we were using preliminary trials our heritabilities were 0 0.4 0 0.3 0 0.5 they're okay quality phenotype data so running you know g by e is reasonably fine, but we need better, strong, good quality phenotype data in each of the target environments. And then with, with the current technologies, there are newer methods with machine learning and other methodologies where we can bring in the weather, weather data, we can bring in soil data. 
incorporate all of that information and then try to predict a target environment and, and that is being done and that is precision breeding and it can be done and it will work well if it is done well and if that is the goal. Okay. Okay, Vika, thank you so much for answering my question. <laughs> no problem, Emma. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, for the uh, so uh, I think uh, let me check if, if we have some. Uh, okay, I think we um, yes, we have another question. Uh, which generation is the preferred to start selection? If two, if six, or later? Yeah, I think I think the question there is there are two there are two ways to think about it. One is. If we go to these elite trials, like definitely F6, F7, F8, those are having really good quality phenotype data. But in just one year, you may have only 50 lines in that nursery. So if we have, if you have seeds from those nurseries, and if you can genotype them and you can put together a reasonable size training set, yeah, the, the later nurseries which have really good phenotype data, the quality of it is really good that would be preferred but then if you do not have seeds and you're starting to do it right now and if you just have 50 lines adding every year you may have to wait a while before you start using the training set so in that case you can consider going in to a slightly earlier nursery like in this case you know they had started working on f35 because it's about 270 lines it's a reasonable size nursery and the important thing is, is to keep you know typing it every year so that the training set keeps increasing and we have a lot a lot of lines so again it, it depends on what resources you have how much time can you wait and and what is the goal of research yeah any advanced nursery will have good quality phenotype data will work really well for predictions and genomic selection um, but it's also important to remember that it will it may take a while to put together a decent sized training population Whereas if you are OK with the heritabilities, we can start a little bit earlier, like F35s or so. But anything before that pretty much may not have. Again, it will depend on in the breeding program uh, if that is that is in the question. But the breeding, if the earlier nurseries have no replicates, you know, it's only tested in one location. The heritability is really low. Definitely those are not the ones that we want to use in the training set. But you can predict on those if you have the marker data. Yeah, OK, thank you so for clear description of the and answering of the questions. Uh, now uh, we don't have any further question for your talk, so thank you because so much. Uh, and um, I would like to end up the, the, the session. Um, tomorrow we will have um, two sessions also as well. Uh, please follow your, uh, up your email and you will get the link soon, maybe after one hour. Uh, I would like to thank the speakers of this day, uh, Dr. Uh, Andreas, uh, it's, uh, yeah, Dr. Matt Hanson, uh, Dr. Uh, Wes Rashid, uh, Dr. Uh, Stephen Manzigar, Dr. Ahmed Salam, and Dr. Vikas Blamkar for their interesting uh, uh, presentations. And uh, uh, see you tomorrow. Thank you all. Thank you. Good luck, Emma. Good luck. Bye.